marriage and courtship. We like that theme. Marriage and courtship. Marriage is the 007 sacrament. It is God's secret weapon. God has designed this sacrament to really foster his life through his creation by inviting men and women to become procreators with him. We said yesterday that God created everything, that we are his creation, his creatures, but beautifully, God, who had no need of man and woman to bring into existence further human beings, decided to associate some men and women with this creative power so that um, husband and wife, parents, become procreators. This, as you realize, is a narrowing down in terms of vocations from what we discussed yesterday night, which was a calling in general. We saw yesterday night in our first conference that by the very fact that we are created by God, endowed with a particular nature which is distinct from that of the cat and of the stone and of the angels, we, according to our nature, that is to be um, souls endowed with reason and free will, but united substantially to a body with organs, limbs and five senses, our calling, generally speaking, is to go where truth and bounty are offered at their utmost and accessing that place, so to speak, through the proper use of our body. That is what defines human beings. The place where truth and bounty are at their utmost is the Holy Trinity. This is where, where we go. This is our general calling. But unlike angels who don't have a body, we are called to achieve this, to, to walk that journey, so to speak, with and through the proper use of our body. Nothing is in our soul which hasn't transited uh, through our five senses. And so the importance of the body and what we do with it, what we allow it to do to serve our soul and not to, uh, to become uh, the master of, of who we are. And so within that general calling, we now distinguish with Father Donahue, we will see later at a conference about consecrated life which is one of the options when somebody, after discernment, prayer, uh, taking advice, realizes that his way of reaching God will be through a certain path of life which entails, uh, for instance, uh, celibacy, possibly uh, formal vows of, a, uh, of religion or a consecration of some kind. We are not yet uh, in that category, this morning we are on the broader and more spontaneous and natural calling, which is to become uh, spouses and then parents. You remember in the book of Genesis how God created uh, the human race as a man and woman, male and female. And so from the beginning, there is that complementarity between man and woman. In fact, it's good to go back to Genesis itself, which I just quote very briefly here. This is, by the way, the Dawe Reigns version of the Bible, which is very fitting here at Dawe Abbey. Uh, it's not a pen, it was actually put together in the city of Dawe in France, whence this abbey was, uh, came from after exile. I open the Holy Bible in the book of Genesis, and uh, we uh, are in chapter 2, 
And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. Let us make him a help like unto himself. And the Lord God, having formed out of the ground all the beasts of the earth and all the fowls of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. For whatsoever Adam called any living creature, the same is its name. And Adam called all the beasts by their names and all the fowls of the air and all the cattle of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper like himself. I wish I had the time to give you the full meditation on this passage, which I gave to some who had the matrimony weekend we had um, a while ago. In a nutshell, what happens there is very important. Adam, with his intellect not yet obscured by sin, since at that stage he hasn't committed a sin, is therefore able to scan the material world and to read the distinctive nature of each being. We can say, this is a tree, this is a cat, this is a cloud, but our knowledge is quite limited. Uh, the knowledge physically of what the thing is, but even more so of what it's its purpose in, in God's plan, that we don't see well. We need a lot of work, and in terms of a supernatural understanding, we need the life of grace. For Adam, not so. Adam, with his mind uh, freshly shaped out of the hands of the Creator, is able to look at all these creatures, that is what is expressed here by this sort of a summoning of Adam and all uh, animals and plants sort of walk uh, or, 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 or appear before Adam, and he names them. It means that he is able to verbalize, to express through words, what constitutes the essence of each particular being. He knows their qualities, the way they work, what they are for, what makes them different in terms of color, shape, etc. That's very important to realize that because when after we read that, but for Adam there was not found a helper like himself, we know that it is not for want of um, intelligence on the part of Adam. It's not as if one of the creatures was his match and because he wasn't equipped to detect it, he missed it. Suppose Adam uh, should have had as his match, I don't know, a uh, little bird to be his companion and be fulfilled. In, in the relationship with the little bird, which is a nice thing to do. Some people do have a little bird in a cage. And, uh, but suppose Adam was not clever enough, so to speak, to read into what the bird is and would have missed that essential companionship. Then we would say, well, you know, it's just an accident and then he will perhaps uh, be happier with a dog because he missed the bird. Not so, I insist. Adam, with his intellect, free from the obscuring of sin and bathed in the divine light, when he sees a creature, he knows exactly what it is, better than a modern scientist even would know. He reads into it in a way unsurpassed. So when we read in chapter 2, uh, verse 20, but for Adam there was not found a helper like himself, we can be sure that this tells us in a very concise way of an existential want in the first man. Whatever the relationship, diverse, varied, beautiful, and fulfilling to some extent, Adam can entertain with God's creation, with all the animals and plants and all that. Still, it doesn't really meet what is essential in him. So you could translate that with loneliness. Adam is lonely, is unfulfilled. Despite, I insist, the, uh, the knowledge he has and the delight he takes uh, in God's creation. 
Next verse, then the Lord God cast a deep sleep upon Adam, and when he was fast asleep, he took one of his ribs and filled up flesh for it. And the Lord God built the rib which he took from Adam into a woman and brought her to Adam. So God forms this new being out of the very substance of the first man. That's interesting. Realize that Adam was shaped from the slime of the earth, from pre-existing matter by God, but not so for Eve. Eve is taken from Adam, already human, already formed. This tells us about the uh, essential complementarity and unity of origin within the human race of uh, women and men. And Adam uh, wakes from his, his sleep, that's verse 23, and Adam said, This now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Adam scans that new creature as he did with the tree, with the bird, with the cloud. When I say scan, I use on purpose a very uh, uh, technical word, but that's to express uh, the, uh, the deep inside reach of his intellect. Uh, as if we were, you know, with a scanner. So he's able to, to do this. He scans that creature and he discovers a level of complementarity with himself which surpasses any interaction he has entertained so far with other beings. And why is that? Because that new being is endowed with reason and free will united as part of her soul to a human body like himself. This other being is aware of herself, aware of himself, aware of God, and within the same human race. So this existential void which Adam suffered up to the creation of Eve is uh, uh, solved. He is able to interact with that new being at a level where what defines him essentially as human being, that is the proper use of intellect and free will through a body, uh, this is matched as never before by that new creature, Eve. This now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. It's difficult to express more beautifully and concisely that unity of origin and complementarity, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Wherefore a man shall leave father and mother and that shall cleave to his wife and they shall be two in one flesh. That unity of the human couple as willed by God. And uh, we go back, back a bit before uh, chapter 1. And God created man to his own image, to the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, saying, Increase and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fishes of the sea, etc. So, this uh, complementarity between male and female as defining the human nature is from the beginning, it is willed by God. And we have the first uh, wedding ceremony taking place in the history of mankind. And that is just here. And God blessed them. So th this blessing, it's, um, it is something which explicits uh, and, uh, and formulates uh, the specific calling of uh, the first human couple to be uh, that their relationship is something holy, is something willed by God, supported by God, that interaction. Now, how is that interaction to manifest itself concretely? Well, it comes immediately after. God bless them, saying, 
increase and multiply and fill the earth. So God bless them. You know, in a sacrament, you have two dimensions. You have a gesture and you have a word, generally. So the gesture, God bless them. Well, he didn't make the sign of the cross, but uh, blessing. And the formula, I only use that analogically. It wasn't a sacrament at that, at that time. The formula, increase and multiply. What is essential here to realize is that the calling, the invitation to become fruitful, to beget other human beings, is by no means accidental to the nuptial blessing. It is the very expressing of the blessing. You could say that the blessing is the calling to fecundity. When you look at Genesis, and just that verse, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 27, just that, you could say you have everything about the, the human couple. And God created man to his own image, to the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and 28, God blessed them, saying, increase and multiply and fill the earth. It's not God bless them and say, Live five years together with our children just to get to know each other and have time to buy a house and a second dog. Um, <laughs> and, and then, then, you know, when, when you're okay, if, you know, then think, think of children. Well, I, I don't see it that way. It's not only the text. It's God bless them and increase and multiply and fill the earth. So the very purpose of this... Uh, most intimate association between man and woman as sanctified by God is to propagate the human race. It is, as was in God's plan, to populate the Garden of Eden with new human beings who will be raised in the knowledge, fear and love of God their Creator under the responsibility of their parents and will, in their turn, become worshippers of the Most High and will be, like you and me, fulfilled in that calling to know God as perfect truth and good and praise Him for that uh, truthfulness and bounty of His. There is a but. The but, and we have to skip many things, the but is uh, the serpent, the apple, the original sin. After that, uh, Adam and Eve are uh, not trusting each other because they ceased trusting God. And as a further consequence, they are divided within. There is uh, uh, you know, bad inclinations and nature has become hostile. And this is why we skip many centuries. The new Adam, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, is sent to, generally speaking, restore human nature into harmony with God. But as applying specifically to the married state, he elevates this natural contract of matrimony to the dignity of a sacrament, I explain. He guarantees and attaches special help to the exchange of vows from then on. Because under the, uh, the condition of sin, it is simply impossible for man and woman to be truly holy in matrimony. Sin creeps in all the time, all the time. Less jealousy, infidelity, uh, anger, etc. And so the sacrament of matrimony is a, a, a succor given by God to those called to the married state that they may really discharge the duties of their state in a way which will lead them to heaven. Obviously, we have just 35 minutes, so I need to be extremely concise, which is a bit frustrating, but uh, we'll have questions later on, if you wish. There are three
three goods of marriage, the, the love of the spouses must be exclusive, fecund, and perpetual. It is exclusive inasmuch as there can be no, while one is married, other partner, other uh, radical gift of self to another human being. So that rules out, of course, adultery, prostitution, but even pornography, and even, I wish I could develop that, but in vitro fertilization and surrogacy, because this is including into the intimacy of the human couple a third person, a doctor, or even more so if it's uh, uh, somebody else giving his own seed or, or simply uh, letting out her womb. This is uh, against uh, that integrity exclusive of marriage. Fecund, that rules out contraception, abortion, of course, sterilization even, unless the purpose is purely to save uh, the person because of bleeding or something like that, um, it is absolutely uh, immoral, sterilization. When the purpose is knowingly to prevent for the conception, this is not licit. And perpetual, it uh, uh, rules out, of course, divorce. Now, divorce is a purely civil disposition. It bears uh, no impact on the reality of the sacramental bond of matrimony. It may be tolerated by the Church, again I insist, as a purely civil disposition to secure for the abandoned party, uh, the husband who is left by his wife or the, the other way around, uh, the, the assistance of the law to compel the guilty one to provide financially for instance, for the wife and children. Okay, so divorce is just about that. It's a purely, it's a practicality. But again, it is of no avail uh, as to the reality of the sacramental bond of matrimony, which remains whatever, as long as the other spouse is alive. Only the death of the first spouse will terminate the bond of matrimony. So you can hire the best lawyer, you will waste your money, because perhaps he will guarantee for you uh, a substantial income and force the husband to sell the family house because he can't pay, uh, which of often happens, unfortunately. Um, but in terms of freedom before God and man, from your matrimonial commitment, I now speak in the uh, unfortunate case of somebody uh, separating from his husband and wife, well, it doesn't make you free. Somebody who is even abandoned, let's take the other way around, the innocent, perhaps, party, uh, admitting that most of the guilt is on, on the other. The one who is betrayed, the one who is abandoned, still remains bound to his or her promise to his spouse, as long as the spouse is alive. And so one may accept a divorce when, again, it is materially um, useful for the family, for the children in particular, but it doesn't change anything as to the fact that one remains married. Therefore, let's say that wife with her children, she must not, cannot start another relationship uh, at a marital level with anybody else. Even more so, of course, for the, the, the husband, if he's the guilty one. There is absolutely zero, zero, zero freedom to start another relationship with sexual intimacy. This is impossible. As you remember from my quote of Genesis, the two ends of marriage are first end procreation, to receive from God that honour, to help him, serve him in populating heaven with new worshippers of the Most Holy Trinity. This is uh, what marriage is first about. But 
that is not one end only, there are two ends, and so the second end is mutual support of the spouses. It's not, it's not a business association. Okay, that's your task, that's mine, okay, let's get on that. No, it's not that. Uh, it, is, it involves, obviously, a man and a woman emotionally, uh, spiritually, and, and practically at every level. And so it presupposes and calls for a real personal love between the spouses. The better spouses act, live together as a couple, animated by God's love, the better they can be parents. So in fact, although the second end, mutual support between husband and wife, comes in dignity only second after procreation, strategically, if I may say, it comes first because it determines their capacity to become good parents and to raise their children in the knowledge, fear and love of the Lord. We all know of examples, certainly I do, of parents who are very good Catholics, did their best to, to raise their children uh, as, as good, uh, good Catholics, and they failed. Many children, absolute failure, every, all of them, tragedy. One of the explanations in that couple is that they exasperated each other. It's very sad. So these children grew up with uh, the, uh, the example of parents who went to Mass every Sunday and observed the religion and did the best they could. But for some sad reason, after a while, that husband, that wife were always upsetting each other and trying to, to tease each other in a nasty way and ridiculing the wife or ridiculing the husband. And, and, and that was going on and on for years. And so, sadly, there's little wonder that the children will repudiate um, the religion these parents taught them, not because the religion is false, but because it was, uh, it was embodied in a human couple where affection was not really displayed. And so the children said, well, the whole package I, I leave, leave away, I leave aside, I'm not interested. So I give that counterexample to make it clear that indeed the true love of the spouses, as spouses, my wife, my husband, our relationship at that level is essential to secure for the children a credible example of Christianity, which they will want to imitate and embrace. And as teenagers, as grown-ups, they will feel confident that um, human love does flourish in Christianity. And so God is worth being worshipped. I have only a few minutes for what comes before marriage, and that is courtship. We would need several hours, so this would just be a few, a few hints. Friendship, friendship between uh, young men, young women, is something which uh, is nowadays almost completely unknown. What the world means by uh, being friends is simply to be sexually active with somebody else. So it seems that the word to know, which in the Bible has a very intimate and sexual meaning, well, the word has been reduced to that biblical meaning only. Do you know her? That's what the world means. Well, not no, I don't know her. <laughs> do you know him? No. Basically, do you fornicate with him? Or with her. That is what the world tells us. Now this is, I dare say, a bit reductive because in fact there is 
a wonderful and varied range of um, levels and shades in a relationship, and I speak only between young men and young women, which is, uh, is not sexual. And if any of you uh, has interest in philosophy, I suggest you, you, you find this again and perhaps write about it, friendship, the classical understanding of friendship. So in the world we, we live in, lust gets in the way of friendship and perverts it very, very soon. In fact, the true knowledge uh, of a woman by a man and of a man by a woman is uh, between their souls. So to know, to know a young woman, to know a young man truly, we need to communicate at the level of souls. And I don't mean by that being side by side on our knees in the church uh, 24 hours a day, which is a very good thing to do, which we are doing here a bit. But I mean that we, we are able to leave sexual attraction at its own place. And that, that belongs to the, the, the married couple in their, in their bedroom. That is where it belongs. It is part of the project. If somebody contemplates matrimony with somebody else, obviously this will be part of it and an important part of it, but not the essential. The essential is really this communication of the souls with that complementarity, uh, which the bodies, of course, express uh, very clearly. But uh, this is only a reflection or an explicitation of the complementarity of the man's soul with that of the woman. We don't think the same way. We don't sense and react the same way uh, as man and woman. This is also why, from official statistics, the huge majority of couples who cohabit separate, or if later they get married, they divorce. They were sold that idea that if you do not go to bed with your friend, then uh, you're not sure he or she will be a good spouse. Rubbish. Just the other way around. The flesh is a screen which prevents reaching the soul. If it is used in its proper way, within the security of marriage with the assistance of God's grace, then it's not a screen, it is an opportunity for a deeper union of the soul. But without this framework, it is a screen, an obstacle. And so cohabiting or uh, even being uh, sexually intimate with somebody who is not a lawful married spouse, then it is an impediment, it is a hindrance. We must therefore see premarital chastity not as uh, something negative. You mustn't do it. The church is very severe, doesn't want you to have fun. Okay. Um, it's not that. It is an investment in your future married life. When you preserve yourself until marriage, you are not saying no, you are saying yes. You're saying yes to the husband or the wife, which perhaps God has destined for you. You are saying no to impulses which are disordered in you or to initiatives, suggestions from the other person. You say no to that. But it's not as if the no were the important thing. This no is only a means to an end, and the end is the yes. The yes is, I want to give myself totally to my future spouse. I don't want to give just a bit. Oh, you know what? I give you that little finger. You can have that. Okay. I give you my ear. Have it. No. 
everything, everything, all that I am, all that I am. And so any intimate, and in this case sexual, expression of intimacy and of surrender and of trust, all this is like a bouquet, like flowers put together in a vase, not one missing. It's all for you. It's all for you. Now, there's nothing more honorable, more beautiful than that in terms of uh, interaction between the two sexes. Deliberate use of sexual organs is uh, licit only, only within marriage. Sometimes you hear, oh, the church, you know, doesn't like homosexuals. But it's, it's, it's not about sex as such. It's just that either one is committed in holy matrimony with somebody else, or one is not. Who is married here? Nobody. Okay, so we are all in the same category. The soon-to-be-betrothed couple the single people here, the consecrated ones here, Father Odeni and I, we are quite diverse in our you know, way of life and, and what we do. And yet, we all fall within the same category. That is, no deliberate uh, use of uh, sexuality. Because, if I may put it very bluntly, sex is for the family, it's for the children. Are you ready to have children? I mean, ready, are you in a state of life where the frailty, the vulnerability of the child made after the image and likeness of God will be secured? Marital fidelity is first and foremost about the child. That is to secure for the child some, uh, uh, a haven, a shield, a shelter, a protection where that, within which the child will be able to grow securely, knowing that mum and dad will always be there. They'll always love each other. And so I will always be under the care and protection of their love. And to grow with that uh, unconscious perspective because the child is too young to formulate it, but, but he senses very much that it's there. This is the best possible treasure gift which adults can give to children, and nothing will replace it. If something happened, tragedy, father's in prison, or the mum dies, or whatever, obviously there will be uh, ways of supplying this with, uh, you know, educational institutions or uh, relatives stepping in and helping to, to bring up the child. But this is accidental. As much as will by God and designed by him, the father and mother are there to offer the child the protection of, of their love. And for that protection to be real and efficacious, the child must have zero suspicion of that that it can break up one day. I'm sure that in this room today, there are some of us who very sadly, very tragically, were deprived from that protection through parents separating, divorcing, or perhaps dying, I don't know. And you will have experienced how uh, undermining this is emotionally, psychologically, and even spiritually. It doesn't mean that you are a failure. It means that you were wounded by that. You are a victim of that. And certainly, by contrast, you want to give your children, if it is your calling, uh, this, this splendor and, and goodness of uh, the perpetual union of the two parents. So, Courtship must, must look at the entire person, of course, body and soul, but essentially 
It must be a, a, a tuning of the two souls. And it starts with, with a normal friendship. And that's why it's a good thing that, that we're here this weekend, because it's, it gives an opportunity simply to get to know each other. I mean, it's not rocket science. You know, just <laughs> There are men, there are women, they are created by God, and they want to get to heaven, and uh, they think that they can be helped by another, uh, somebody of the opposite sex, and say, they see if, uh, if they get on well. Do we laugh together? Do, do we like the same things? Do we have the same ambition, same interest, same cultural background? I don't mean it has to be that way, but you, you check. You check what... Uh... The little difficult thing is that to get to know each other, we have to become a, a bit intimate. You can't remain you know, at a long distance <laughs> uh, to, to get to know each other. And there must be jokes, there must be moments of silence or even sadness together, whatever it is, doing things a bit, even in a smaller group perhaps, even just two, one young man, one young woman. But it's a delicate thing, isn't it, to, to allow this to develop without falling into sin. Or, well, that would be a sin as well, without giving false hopes to the other person. Like playing playing with the other person, pretending. And that's... There may be a reason why somebody spontaneously will have that attitude, and it may be because the person is shy. The person, in fact, lacks confidence, and so he or she uh, puts on sort of a mask of uh, the friendly guy, the, uh, the, uh, the casual woman, whatever. But... We must really, if, if we love, we must respect the other person. So we mustn't give false hopes. The signs we provide must be true. When we put our hand on the shoulder of somebody, uh, it must mean affection or any, any other demonstration of affection, tenderness you, you can think of, or the way you speak, or, or the, the, the way you, you spend time together, especially if it's only one one boy, one girl. It must be. Uh, it. It doesn't have to mean. Oh, I mean by that I'm going to marry you. I'm not saying that. But it must be something open to to a further development of the relationship. And if it's not the case, and if somebody is acting in that way at the same moment in his or her life with several people, then it's. It doesn't help at all. It doesn't help the uh, the, the 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 persons, your friends. And it doesn't help you, because then you are, well, you are stagnant. You are not going anywhere. The man must be, this is very schematical, so excuse it, but just the time uh, demands it. The man must be serious in the relationship, even though he may be humorous. He must protect the young woman. He mustn't be a predator, predator. Um, it's not a hunting ground. Okay. Those who do that will end up in hell. The woman must be modest. She must be uh, kind. And she mustn't either be a temptress. You know very well what I mean. Those who do that will also end up in hell. I obviously mean in either case if they don't repent. But to, to basically organize one's way of life to attract attention in a way which we know is insincere and to a level, to a degree which we know and intend will lead another human being into grave sin. This is a grave sin. And when we sin gravely, we expel God's life from our soul, and if we die unrepentant, we go to hell. And a very final word, which again will have to be very uh, simplified. The husband is the head of the wife. Like, as St. Paul teaches, Christ is the head of the church. Now, the like is very important. 
if we do not look at the hierarchy within the human couple and family um, in the light of the uh, type, the model, which is the relationship between Christ and the church, then we, we necessarily will fall into misunderstandings and uh, twisting the, uh, the principle and it will be unbearable and you get feminism, which is a normal reaction when that relationship is not well understood. Indeed, Christ, his head of the church, gave himself to his church, sacrificed himself to, uh, to foster her purity, sanctity, and is united to her uh, in a way which is unsurpassable. And so the same within the married couple. The husband is the head. He ultimately is the one which, who will make the decisions, but always in a collaborative way and after due uh, in a reflection with his wife. But in the end, for any society, when there is more than one person, there has to be one of those who will have the last word. And institutionally, as designed by God, it is the husband. I'm not saying that the husband is always cleverer, more intelligent and better advised than his wife. Sometimes he isn't at all, in fact. Um, but with all the adaptations you can think of, this is the way God wants it. So the wife, in fact, will find her fulfillment in uh, supporting, counseling, advising, uh, accompanying her husband. But it should be really in accidental cases that she will step in when the husband becomes incapable of governing the family. And it does happen sometimes. The husband is sick or nervous breakdown or something. And then, of course, uh, just like when during the war, uh, the women went to the factory uh, because the men were in the trenches. So uh, you step in. But it's not the normal, the normal way of things. And finally, yes, the husband being the, uh, like the mind and the wife, the heart of, of that entity of the family and still within the equal dignity of the two spouses. I end with an essential point, which is the inalienable rights of parents upon their children. By the very fact that the new human being called child arrives into existence through the necessary mediation of his father and mother, these two adult human beings acquire, even from a natural perspective, a right over that new person. And the right, of course, is to foster the good of that person. And this is essentially manifested through education, so that the state has simply not the right to so-called educate the children against the uh, sound wishes and expectations of the parents. The parents may seek the assistance of institutions such as the state, such as even the church or a homeschooling association, whatever it is. But this is only uh, by delegation of their own inalienable rights. So the rights of parents to educate their children, to choose which school they go or which school they don't go to, and within a given curriculum, which courses, classes they attend and which they do not attend. This is a strict inalienable rights of parents and by no means something the state has any right to decide upon against the legitimate will of the parents. The state does not delegate to the parents a right to help in the education of children. It is the other way round. And my friends, not to frighten you, but if your calling is holy matrimony and therefore open to life, raising your children as saints so that they may worship the Holy Trinity in heaven, you will have to know your rights, you will have to be strong because we live at a time when more and more the state is curtailing your God-given rights and natural rights upon your children. So let us not be afraid, 
the family is uh, willed by God. Marriage is a beautiful calling if it is yours, but know the duties and responsibilities together with the joys which pertain to that beautiful state. And trust very much in the Holy Family of Nazareth to be your model, uh, protector and intercessor.